Hello and welcome to Tracing Your European Ancestors. My name is Julie Goucher. This is a presentation that I delivered at Who Do You Think You Are Live 2015, the 16th to the 18th of April. The event was held in Birmingham at the NEC, the National Exhibition Centre, and the presentation was delivered on Friday the 17th of April in the Society of Genealogists Theatre Room 3. They had a, a time span of 45 minutes, which is an incredibly short amount of time to talk about Europe and the complexities of researching your European ancestors. As with most of the events done at Who Do You Think You Are, most of those events are not recorded. Therefore, what I've done is I've gone back to the original presentation and I'm adding in the audio to the original slides. So that may well be that you were at the event, in which case I hope you enjoyed the event. The, the whole event and I hope you enjoyed European Ancestors. This will give you an opportunity to hear again um, the essence of what I shared on the day. If you weren't able to be there then I'm sorry that you missed a great show um, and this gives you an opportunity to look again at the topic and to take advantage of the audio version of the presentation. So what you have here is a map of Europe. Um, which is effectively the area all covered in white. There are several countries that you will see written with the title of the name um, in green, Armenia, Cyprus and Greenland, and none of those countries are in fact in Europe. Because the book will be out later in the year, I have devised a website which is live now. The web link will be available at the end of the slides. There is no information at all on Armenia on the actual website nor in the book. The same can be said of Cyprus and Greenland. However, they both appear on the website because I felt sure it would be useful to people because uh, perhaps you were like me and um, it wasn't until I started researching this book that I in fact realised that Greenland is not actually in Europe. Um, so it would be just useful to have that sense of information. One of the key things I know I said on the day is that you really need to get to grips with Europe. You need to know the geography of the, of the, of the continent and to know the neighbouring countries. It may well be that you need to consider, does the country that neighbours your research country, um, were they always friends? If you look at the lines of Germany, for example, and France, um, they've not always been allies. So it just gives you a sense of understanding to just pinpoint um, the changes and how Europe has changed over time and the views of Europe over time. On the day um, at the presentation, I actually did, uh, I made a statement and I, which basically said that you have people in two camps. You have Europeans coming to the UK um, from continental Europe. And then you have those in the UK researching back across the channel to continental Europe. And on the face of it, let's look the same thing just in the reverse order. The reality of it is is they are completely different things and it takes you just a bit of time to realise that they are different things and why they are different. So we're now going to look at the major significant events. The biggest thing that you will see there is the First and Second World Wars. So building on something that I've already said is that you need to know your enemy. So understand the political arena of your country from within and then the political arena from outside your country. So in terms of the First World War, Italy, for example, was an allied nation of the United Kingdom, but in the Second World War, it initially was not. I think also it's worth just exploring an understanding around border changes over time countries have lost regions, gained regions over where the border of a country changes. Um, I'm just thinking of a quick example, which would be the region around the border of Switzerland and Italy is a really good example. Um, and later on in the presentation, I in fact mentioned several surnames who, who are historically Italian surnames, but they are really Swiss Italian as opposed to Italian. One of the 
really fascinating things I discovered when I was researching the book was around an event that happened at the start of the Second World War involving Poland and Russia. Um, at the beginning of the hostilities, Russia and Germany were very aware of each other's existence and the fact that they were each other's major threat. In order to protect themselves, they agreed to a pact, which basically said they weren't going to invade each other. As soon as that pact was created, the Russians started to invade Poland from the east, whilst German advancement was going through from the west. As a consequence, we have around about 115,000 Poles were taken prisoner and were sent to various labour camps in Russia. During a period of time of around two years, that number suffered huge amounts of hardship. They were poorly fed, they were malnourished, they were riddled with disease. Until the point that they got a sense that the Germans were going to break the pact. What happened then was something that I found quite fascinating, was that the Polish that had been interned in Russia were in fact released. Russia at this point was an ally of Britain. Britain had a heavy influence in the country we now know as Iran, but at this point in time it was known as Persia. So those prisoners were released from the Russian custody and were released in order to form military units and regiments that would fight the advancement of Germany through into Russia. The Polish were taken on ships across to Persia, where they were placed in settlement camps so they could adjust, start to recuperate, and they could start to form the military operational group they needed. The reality of it was, as I said, there was 115,000 of these people that had been imprisoned in Russia. And where you get periods of time where you're not being fed properly, but you're still working incredibly hard and you become ill and riddled with disease, you sadly acquire death. And as a result of death, you typically have cemeteries. And there is, in fact, two cemeteries in modern Iran that are the final resting place for several hundred of the Poles that had been imprisoned in Russia. It was something that I hadn't come across before, um, even though I've been researching for many years. Um, but I found it was a fascinating um, piece of history that you could explore and research. There is some information and some links on the website, and there is links to a video that's on YouTube of someone who researched um, and actually managed to get hold of various people. It took him 50 years to record um, the conversations that he managed to find from people, which was really wonderful. Um, and I would urge you to just go and have a look on YouTube. The links are on the segment you know, on the website. In terms of border changes, we have instances where Yugoslavia, for example, has stopped being one country and is now represented by eight. We have European empires, Prussia, Hanover and the British, that have influenced the shape of Europe. Um, a, an example of that is the influence that Britain had over India. And therefore we see many um, British names in India. And we see other names, Spanish, Italian, Portuguese, in India and it's worth exploring. And of course we see political unrest as I've already mentioned Yugoslavia and then we have the more recent um, unrest that we've had in Ukraine earlier this year. We now have challenges and probably the, the biggest challenge is going to be around languages and dialects. Um, what you will find is that most, and understandably so, is that most of the documents are going to be written in the native language. So you need to have a degree of understanding of the language. 
it's not impossible to do it without any degree of understanding but you will need access to a really good dictionary and I would recommend that if you see a document that you try and get a photocopy or a digital image so that you can go away and look at the information that's contained within the document and just so that you can work on it in an unrushed environment because otherwise you will miss things. Know your geography so understand the borders the countries that neighbour your research country. Is your country like France and has sea on three sides or is it an, an inland country and therefore you need to understand if they were going to migrate and they were going to go by boat where would be the nearest port which is the nearest three ports and which would be the cheapest which would be the easiest to, to navigate to. Did you live in one country but the reality of it was you were actually nearer a port in another country. You need to know the history you're going to be putting your European ancestors into the context of their country. You're going to be exploring political influences or religious influences. The example we have here is from May 1847. This is a document that's actually um, in the National Archives in Kew in London. It dates, as I said, from May 1847 and is a list of aliens entering the country. So this was written by the same hand. If you look at all the details there, there's five individuals there, two people that came from Germany, one from France and two from Italy. But the handwriting is the same script. So this was written by a clerk who was at Folkestone, which is the port on the southeast coast of England. It's still a port today and still has regular links to France. But this was the boat that left Boulogne, again another port but in France, and routinely made those journeys across the Channel. So this document was written by an administrative who wrote the details of the people as they arrived off the vessels. We noticed several things. The first thing is it only tells you the country of origin, so Germany, France and Italy. It doesn't tell you where in those countries they came from. So in that respect, the lack of information is not overly helpful. But if you look at the next column along, which is the profession, and the third column along from the right, where it talks about the status, they're all given the title of Mr. Um, which tells you that the official who was writing this document made a judgment on the person he saw in front. So they arrived looking relatively well kept. They presumably had money to be able to afford the, the passage. It gives you an, you can get a sense of the people that are on the document. So whilst as it stands, the document is perhaps not overly helpful, it does give you some clues as to the well-being or the financial well-being of the individuals concerned. This, um, as I said, came from this particular entry was um, from Ancestry. But the original are at the National Archives in Kew. And the reason I've utilised this one is because it features in my Orlando one name study. But I have no idea as to which Mr Orlando that is and where in Italy they came from. But it gives us a sense that we were recording migrants coming into the United Kingdom from as far back as 1847 and even before. There's other changes in terms of the Second World War. We see a huge amount of displaced people. We have the very sad and tragic effects of the Holocaust. We see the creation of the USSR and an entire area from East Germany right across East, right across to Russia, being closed off until 1990 when the Berlin Wall came down and the East and West were able to unify again. What we see there though now is a series of records that were all under Russian control and they are gradually starting to come online and to be made available. We are sensing there's a shift in the mindset of um, the political arena in Russia. Of course, we see many more records in 2015 than we saw in 2014. And I have no doubt that as we go forward into the next um, decade, we're going to see many more records appear. But of course, none of us actually know just how many more records are available um, 
and you don't know what you don't know. So if you want to, if you're researching in that part of Europe, you need to be creative as to how you can tease out the bits of information, the snippets, and ask the questions around what you need to know, and not give up when you get a, a negative response, because even a negative response is worth capturing. And not all negative res responses are in fact negative bits of information. You will need to be creative to overcome the challenges in how you scope out your European ancestry. And I would suggest that you perhaps connect with others and not necessarily people who are researching your line. Perhaps people research in your region, in, you, in that country. Um, maybe they're researching the same surname, but somewhere else. We are a much more um, movable population. So just because you see somebody researching that name in the United States or Canada or Australia or wherever else they may be, don't think that they may not be or they won't connect to your family, because unless you ask the question, you won't necessarily know. What we see here is a series of major European resources. Um, the hardest thing actually was pulling together the resources because there are just so many that I could have suggested to you. But in a 45 minute time slot, it was very difficult to know which were the best ones to, to produce. What you see here, though, is the list that I did give at the presentation. Now, who do you think you are? All on this list are free resources, with the exception of Ancestry, which we will look at first. So Ancestry is a commercial site. Um, you do need, in order to access the records, you need to have a paid account. Um, some of the records are free, so there are instances where you can access free BMD, for example, um, and that's freely available, but it's on the Ancestry portal. What I would say is if you want to be looking at European records, you will need a worldwide subscription. And whilst there are other commercial sites, Ancestry is by far the one that has the most European material, of the paying sites at least. Here enters Family Search. Family Search is a phenomenal resource. There isn't just material being archived, scanned and indexed. There is also a wiki on the site um, in the learning section and it is certainly most worthwhile having a look through and just exploring and explore not just by country explore by region explore by the surname explore by the religion and just see what other bits of information you can tease out and explore we then see nationalization records the listing i've given there is there are not not all of them have survived and there are nationalization records at kew so it's certainly worth exploring and just seeing what's available and again i wouldn't just explore by your surname explore by the country and just see what else it teases out national libraries pretty much everywhere has a national library um, I wouldn't just explore national libraries, I would also explore university libraries, certainly many in the United States and in Canada have a really good archive section and it's worth exploring and see, but the same could be said of the United Kingdom and, and Australia and New Zealand, it is most certainly worth exploring and just see what materials are, and because if you don't know, if you don't look, you may miss something which should be really vital to your research. So explore those. Also research and have a look through and see if there's anything at a local library level. Um, you can certainly access Ancestry, for example, at many of the libraries um, in the United Kingdom. Whether you will get the worldwide subscription or just the British um, the UK version will depend on the local authority that funds the library, but it is worth asking the question and having a look on the site. You then have access to sites, religious groups, so the Catholic Family History Society, for example, and the Huguenot Society. Again, worth exploring, um, especially if you've got a fresh ancestry, for example, where you can explore and just tease out and understand when the Huguenots left France, what they did, why they did, where they went when they arrived in the United Kingdom, and what it meant for them, and did they go back to France at some point in the future. It's, all, it's worth exploring it and remember just to tease out the bits of information and it will take you time. It will be almost like um, 
how you would eat an elephant. You will eat an elephant in bite-sized chunks and that's how you're going to research your European ancestry. Cindy's List is again another completely free resource filled to the gills with lots of links and access to various other sites and certainly worth exploring. The next two sites, Italian Gen and German Gen, are both US-based sources. They are um, a group of um, individuals, family historians, who have scanned and researched and transcribed the German migration and Italian migration into the United States, typically New York. However, if you use those sites and just put in the surname that you're researching, it is possible to see where that surname pops up. So I did this for my Orlandos, for example, although my particular branch of Orlandos came from Sicily to the United Kingdom and went to Surrey. It's certainly worth exploring. So you just pop your name into um, let's look at marriages or naturalizations. Just pop the name in and just see. Some of them just say Italy. Some, though, give you more detail. They will tell you Milan. They will tell you the commune. It just depends on how much information was given by the person when they completed the paperwork at the very start of the process. So it's worth almost researching sideways and in a much more 360 dimension so that you get a really good sense for where you have to look. Because when you don't know where to look, you have to start somewhere. Also, it's worth mentioning Wikipedia. Now, with Wikipedia, there are lots of sources and there are also lots of data without any sources. But it's a stepping stone. So I would certainly recommend that you just have a look on Wikipedia and just see what material is there. Use it as a stepping stone to give you a sense of what information. But do take care to make sure that you cite your source, so where you've got your information from. The genealogy on Facebook site there. Um, you do need an account on Facebook to obviously access the various groups. There are lots and lots of genealogical groups. The site I've given there talks around a whole pile of genealogical groups on Facebook and it will just give you a sense of just how many. And there are all sorts, not just researching in different countries, there's researching by different surnames, there's DNA projects, there's a whole wealth of information. I mentioned libraries um, a little while ago and the British Library has a European blog. Um, it is certainly worth exploring that. There is a whole font of information there and it's worth, well worth exploring and just seeing what information is there. So we're moving across now to the United Kingdom and Ireland or the Republic of Ireland. Now, before 1922, Ireland was quite simply Ireland and it was part of the United Kingdom. Um, it has now been broken into two. So we now have Northern Ireland, which is part of the United Kingdom, and is six counties to the north. And the remainder of Ireland is the Republic of Ireland. As I said, in 1922, that division took place. What you will find is that there are records in the National Archives of Ireland, which reflects to the south to the Republic of Ireland, which is the south of the country, and the public record of it of Northern Ireland is pertaining to regions in the north. However, I have found instances where material that I would have thought would have been in the south has in fact been in the North American office, and vice versa. And especially if you are researching surnames or places or regions that are on the border of the two. I would say check both lots of archives because you don't know and if you don't if you don't let look you'll never know what's available. We also see the National Archives of Wales and the National Archives of Scotland. We then also have the National Archives which I've already mentioned once based at Kew. So what you see for the United Kingdom is you see records are held centrally so for things like birth marriages and deaths, you have, we have a general registration district process, um, which is held obviously centrally with local registration districts, which enables you to drill down, which you would always send to the same place to get the birth and marriage and death records for England and Wales. You send the same to Scotland and then similarly for Northern Ireland. 
What you also have, though, is you have county records officers. So I live in, in Devon. So there is a Devon records office. There, in for Devon, there, it's in more than one place. So you do need to explore. And in order to find your feet in understanding where your research is for the United Kingdom, I would recommend that you go and look at the top link, which is a, a site called Januki, which is a free font of knowledge for those researching in the United Kingdom. Um, it drills down to not just national archives, but county archives, local archives, and it's worth exploring. And then you will also find perhaps this material with um, in museums. You may find there's other material in other archives, which are perhaps not necessarily the most obvious. So I would always check the counties that surround um, the counties that I'm looking at. So I'll research a lot of my time in Surrey, but I have found Surrey records in Hampshire and Sussex, again, two counties that neighbour Surrey. A lot of the material that you may well see was around, it's archived and deposited around the original landowners. And it is possible that perhaps the landowner lived in another county completely, and that will be where you find the information from. It's also worth checking and just remembering that the Aliens Act of 1914 made it compulsory that anyone over the age of 16 had to register with the police. So until that time, foreigners, so people that didn't sound English, um, lacked rights until they became naturalised. And you will find some naturalisation records at Q, which is the second link on the list there. Naturalisation, though, was expensive. So if people didn't become naturalised, they just had less, they had less rights. And they, of course, were subjected to ridicule for not just sounding different, but perhaps in times of war, we've had German interned because of the First and Second World War. And in the Second World War, we had Italians interned. Of course, it isn't just about a German or an Italian being interned. Perhaps you have a German name, but you were in fact born in England. And I think that, that just gives you a sense that people want to sound British. They don't want to sound foreign. And therefore, they want to make their name change so they fit, they fit in. And it's worth just being a little bit creative on the name was given to your ancestors. And just to have a look at just how that all fits together. So now we're going across the channel to France. So France is divided into 27 administrative regions. Most of them are on the mainland, but there are five that are overseas territories, um, of which one is Corsica. It's considered a region just for the administrative purposes. And then within each region, it's certainly subdivided down into departments, and the amount of departments will depend on each region. There's a link there that I've given you to Huguenot ancestors, and there's a link there to a very um, interesting and useful French library. What you see here is a mapping tool. Now, I know I'm, I'm sure I told the group that I presented to at Who Do You Think You Are that I spent some time on the Thursday of Who Do You Think You Are on what is the what is called the expert table. And I had a number of people come to me on the two sessions I did on the expert table. Um, they were all researching in various parts of Europe. And a lady came to see me on the Thursday who was researching this surname in that region of France. Now, I directed the lady to this map because it's quite, it's very clever and very useful. So I'll explain to you the way it works. So on the search engine, on that site, you pop the name in that you're researching. In this instance, it's the name of Dashin. And then you click the link of the top left. You'll see there is four date links that range between 1891 and 1990. And as you click the link, the map changes because it shows the amount of instances of that surname in those regions for that period of time. And it's quite useful. So, between 1836 and 1936, there was a census in France every five years. The exception was during the period of the Second World War. And we also have a link there for a really useful site for another for researching your French ancestors. 
certainly I would have, I would explore, because if you don't know, if you think back to that very first um, aliens document that I showed you, and it just says France, that doesn't give you a huge amount to go on, because you need to be able to drill the details down, not just to these regions, but drill it right down even further to know exactly the town, because all records are held locally. So if you're researching a particular name and it just says they were born in France, then you just pop the name in and see. Now, it may mean that you have a, a, a very typical French surname, in which case you're going to have an awful lot um, of the map turn a different colour, which will reflect the amount of instances of the name. But if you haven't got a very common surname, then those are perhaps the parishes or the areas that you look in first to explore where the surname occurs and just to see what information you can tease out. So now we go across to Spain and Portugal and you'll also see on the map there a tiny, tiny little country on the border there um, of France which is Andorra. Um, again, Spain as this map shows is divided into 17 different regions of which two are a series of islands so the canary islands is the in the bottom inset box um, and you can see it's made up of, of a few islands there um, it's, it's useful because perhaps the records are held where that where they're going to be held is going to be different and also it's around just exploring the lifestyle the cultural differences are going to be very different on the um Canaries Islands of, say, say Future Ventura than it is going to be if you're looking at Madrid, for example. I've given just two sites here as a bit of a um, a, a summer a starting point. The first is um, a site kept by a lady who I think lives in the United States, but she's researched quite a lot in Spain and she has a really useful website around how you research in Spain. And also it's about how other people have researched in the same area and you can tap into their bits of information and what they may have shared with you. It's worth looking to see what pitfalls they've encountered. Um, have they found a loophole to navigate around or have they said if you look at this archive it gives you a really good breakdown of material. It's really worth exploring. And then the second link I've given there is the National Archives, uh, National Library of Portugal. Again a really useful site. Now we're moving on to Italy. Now again, this illustration here is another mapping tool, um, and this is for the surname Orlando, which is the name that I'm researching, my Italian surname that I'm researching. So again, you go to the link, you just pop the name in, and this particular map gives you different options in terms of how the information is displayed. This is by far the better option because it's much more visual, and the darker the colour, the more intensity the concentration is of the surname. The reality of it is, is that nearly every, well, all regions apart from a very small sliver um, have instances of the surname Orlando. So it's, a, it's really tough if you're researching a really popular name in a particular country, but you have to start somewhere. And that's what the map looks like. So you have the Anglo-Italian Hamisher Society, which is um, a UK based group. But there are members that live all across the globe um, who are researching, certainly perhaps their British ancestors. The thing with Italy is that what you find is that Italians have been coming to the United Kingdom since Roman times. But what they would do is they would walk very often, especially from the south, across Italy to where there was cheap um, transportation. Or they would perhaps walk across Italy and across France to come up to somewhere like Boulogne where they would then cross the channel and come to the United Kingdom. If they didn't have enough money to carry, go forth and go perhaps due to the United States, they stopped, they found some work and they started to save. But it was increasingly difficult. So this just gives you a sense of timing and understanding and sometimes you need to research the bigger picture of your European ancestors in order before you can even drill down to your own family history. What we see there though is in 1861 is the unification of Italy. Um, 
we see that Italy is divided into 20 regions and again it's divided into provinces, down to communes, down to frazoni which is villages and hamlets. Again you need to drill right down to the detail, it's not just enough to say they came from Sicily or they came from Sardinia, you need to be very very specific and drill right down to the detail. And then we have the low countries, so the low countries are typically Belgium, the Netherlands and Luxembourg and I've just given a, a, a few sites here. The interesting one here is the state archives in Belgium, um, such a small country but they have their archives spread across 19 different sites. Um, so you would need to do, if you're researching your Belgian ancestors, you would need to do your homework to see exactly where the material that you want to see is. A lot of the material for any site of these across Europe will nearly always have an English translation because um, those people who live in continental Europe are so much more better equipped at learning English than we are at learning their language. So it is certainly worth just looking for the little, normally it's a little English flag or an American flag, you just click the link and it just translates the page into English. Alternatively, you just need to use a Google Translator. For Luxembourg, there are two Luxembourgs. One is the Grand Duchy of Luxembourg, which is an independent nation, and another is a province of Belgium. And the two um, examples I have at the top are about Dutch roots and again a really they're both really really useful sites and I would recommend you go and have a look at them. And now we move on to Germany and this is a real I found a really interesting uh, mapping site um, because whilst we've seen already two maps in this presentation it gives you a sense of the visual aid which enables you to see at a glance where the name occurs. So the first thing is the Anglo-German family, Anglo family history society which has been around for about 25 years or so. Um, a really useful site and there are a variety of other sites that are linked to the Anglo-German family history society site and certainly well worth exploring. The mapping site you see here is based on telephone books. Um, so what I did for this example here is I just popped in the surname of Orlando because I'm looking for them everywhere um, and this is the distribution for them for 1998 in Germany. What is really fascinating is that there is a distribution for the surname, well for any name, um, in 1942 when of course Germany was at war. But they of course were at war but they were um, the mindset is they were at, in, in the successful mode and therefore why would you not create a telephone book? Um, it's a truly interesting concept and it's fascinating that it has survived. What we do see though is a series of modern states. We have 16 states um, across Germany and some of them were formed in the second half of the 20th century, so after the unification in 1990. And it's worth exploring, was there a name change? after the war came down, especially if you were a town on the on nearest the border. It's just worth exploring and having a look. And then we reach into Austria. I, I've put the GenWeb, um, which is the top link there, um, but GenWeb is actually a really useful site for wherever you're researching. And the Austro Austria Gen website is a really useful one and it's worth exploring. And then we have the Austrian State Archives. Um, I've done some research um, at the Austrian State Archives and they were very, very helpful. Um, they weren't able to give me exactly what I wanted, but they did enable me to at least navigate my way around their website and to explore. And she steered me in the right direction to where I needed to be looking at which really helped. It's also worth remembering, if you're researching in somewhere like Austria, that it was actually um, divided. It was after the Second World War, whilst we still had um, British troops stationed in Germany and in what was the Third Reich effectively, were on the area under German control, you still see references to the British military that were there and certainly um, I know from personal experience that Austria was in the segment that was looked after by the British. So there are instances where British troops married Austrian women 
who had obviously lived through the German occupation. And again, Austrian history in this period of time, say in the 1930 period, is really useful because it sets the scene as to how Austria became to be so controlled by Germany. For Scandinavia, I've given you just a few links here. So we've got the Geological Society of Finland. The Swedish Root site is again a really fascinating site. And then you have the Swedish Archives online. Um, more and more material is coming online all the time. Not because it's been hidden away, just because with all archive services, what do you make available first? And then to look at Norwegian naming patterns. And again, the countries that form what we would describe as Scandinavia are Denmark, Norway, Sweden, Iceland and Finland. And remember what I said, Greenland, which perhaps you might think should be in this section, is in fact not in Europe. So it appears on the website, but not in the book. And for Switzerland, it borders Italy and there are four official languages. So we have German, French, Italian and Romash, which is an early Latin dialect. Um, Swiss roots there is a really fascinating site. The bottom link there um, is around the Swiss in Canada. And whilst it perhaps you think it may not help you, it is actually a really useful site to have a look at. And I think that, again, it's just drilling the point of it doesn't matter where the author is of the website or where or what the focus is of the website. If the subject matter is what you what you're interested in, that's what matters. So don't exclude material and sites that perhaps look at um, the Swiss in Canada. It's a really good it's a really good site if you're researching your Swiss ancestry. And worldnames.publicprofiler.org um, is another useful mapping site, um, but it isn't just looking at Swiss surnames. It looks at a variety of surnames, but it's particularly useful for this one. So now we see Poland. Um, there is not a huge amount of detail that I've given you here. And what you see here is genealogy in Poland, which is a Polish roots, another useful site. And then we have the West Prussian land records. What I always find amazingly fascinating is that all the upheaval and destruction that this part of Europe especially saw, Second World War period. And yet the records... A great many of them have survived. Um, and certainly when I was looking at the Russian records, there are an amazing amount of really quite odd things have survived and it, it and just enables you to flesh out those bits of information that you may otherwise have not noticed. Now we come to the Balkans. So the Balkans is the region of Czechoslovakia, Hungary, Romania, Greece, Bulgaria. And then you have the former Yugoslavia and those countries listed there are now the countries represented. But you will notice the border of the country. So if you look at the region as a whole, it borders Italy, Austria, Hungary, um, Romania. You can see there, so Serbia, Kosovo, just how, and you can also understand just how much this period, this area was almost decimated over a period of time in the early 1990s. For this region in particular, it's worth just understanding what the religion of your ancestors was and the religion practiced in the country. What was the most common religion? And that will very often give you a bit of a clue as to um, perhaps any issues that may have arisen for the people who were living there. So now we have Ukraine. This website here that I've given, it lost Russian and Ukrainian family, is an incredible site. It was It's written by an American journalist who was researching her own family. And she started researching her family while she was on maternity leave until she became completely frustrated by how difficult it was to research in this region. And her view was, I'm a journalist, I should be able to research anything. She has and created a phenomenal site and it is certainly worth exploring and reading and just getting started and see the pitfalls and issues that she has overcome. It's an incredibly fascinating site. 
And then we have Russia. Now, as I said a little while ago, that there are some amazing documents that have survived the test of time, um, especially given the amount of destruction that's happened over the last 300 years in this region. If you look at um, the wonderful delight there of a beer tax, which was imposed by Peter the Great in 1698, the document has actually survived and which is incredible there is some information on the russian revolution at the national archives at kew it's part of the education series so it's aimed at um, the age group of probably sort of 10 to 12 13 but if you don't know anything about the country and about this period of russian history it is certainly no matter what your age going and having a look at the site and just finding your feet and just seeing what other bits of information that you can access there and just to pick up um, because don't forget every time we read something we have something in our mind that tells us what else we should go and have a look at and it's just worth exploring now european surnames are fascinating i mean surnames in general are fascinating but especially european ones um, this wordle was created on the in early hours of the morning on the 17th of april it lists all the surnames that are registered with the guild of one name studies um a, a one name study is a concept where you capture instances of that surname whatever that surname may be and you capture it wherever they occur so my own surname for Orlando, for example, is registered with the Guild and has been since 2002. And you'll see it towards the top on the left hand side. Um, I mentioned a little while ago um, about Swiss Italian names. And there are two here, again, registered with the Guild of Diviani, which is on the right hand side, and Brentini, again, are up towards the top. There are a variety of names here. So there is Italian, there's Swiss, there's Dutch. Um, there's a couple of Polish names, there's some German names. It's worth exploring. The reality of a, a one name study is if you have an, a surname that is, let's use the term of unusual, the chances are if you find it wherever you find it, you will capture the information. And it is absolutely worthwhile recording the information. Because in the early days of your research, you don't know if it's going to come in handy and people did walk and migrate hundreds of miles perhaps more than we give them credit for it's certainly worth going to the guild website which is one hyphen name dot org and just popping in your european surname and seeing if it is registered what is also useful doing is as you pop your name in you will not only will you see if it's registered you will see if the name occurs in any of the various guild indexes you don't have to register a study in order to become a guild member and you can become a guild member um, for a modest fee um, certainly i would recommend it and i would say definitely go and have a look at onename.org the things that you will need to remember if when you look at your European surname is look at the spelling was the name changed in order to sound less foreign was there an accent for the enumerator or the administrator to record the name so did he write what he thought he heard as opposed to what he heard was there um, dialects for we've already discussed accents languages um i, I did hear a, a, a quite an interesting um, i had a very interesting discussion with somebody on the saturday of who do you think you are somebody came to the expert table where i was on the saturday and said that they were researching a i think it was a norwegian name <clears throat> um and the first name was just and it was like, I don't think that was his name at all. Or was it? Was it short for, we would say probably, is it short for Justin? Or did he say it was just? And it was, when I told that to the, the couple that were sitting opposite me, they looked to me in amazement and then kind of the penny dropped. And you need to be really creative. Um, we've got people that were arriving, wherever they were arriving. They'd got off a boat, they'd been on the boat for several days, maybe several weeks. And depending on whether maybe it was even several months 
all they wanted to do was to just find where they were going to stay meet up with hopefully that people with people that they perhaps knew or people that were connected with other people that perhaps they knew and i think that you need to perhaps almost um look at your european ancestors as if you're peering through a keyhole and you're observing what somebody would have done imagine if it was 1850 what you would have done if you were going to live in another country you would probably go and live with people or near people that you knew or who are friends of friends of a friends and you will find these communities that spring up and the italians are really a, a good one you know if we look at places like london they have little Italy sort of in Clerkenwell and you'll see the same with the German community in various towns. And I'm sure even if you live in Australia or New Zealand or in the States, you will know the areas where the best delis are, um, the best German bakery is. You'll know all those things because it's your environment. And because they're there is because there has pretty much probably been a, a population of those nationalities there for a time and it's certainly worth exploring now we're going to quickly i'm not going to cover dna um in huge detail here in fact in barely any detail at all at the event there were many many more qualified people to talk about dna than i what i would say is that dna studies are an opportunity to explore and you will find dna studies that feature on surnames um, the Diavani and Orlando, for example, they both have DNA studies. There's geographical um, DNA studies. So there is an Italian, there is um, a Czechoslovakian, I believe. Um, there is a French um, DNA study. Um, it is worth exploring those. There is also religious um, studies. So Jewish studies for example um, and it is certainly again worth exploring and just seeing what there is there is much more information on DNA in terms of links and where you can go and have a look at on the website um, I will give you the link now and it's european-ancestors.info forward slash DNA um, but it is linked from the main slide at the moment which you will see the detail of So final words. So begin. The rest is easy. Um, leave no stone unturned. Have a look and just see if you think there may be a chance of a reference that you can have a look at. Explore it because it's worth exploring it. Look to areas outside of Europe. As I said, if you look at things like India, for example, there are other instances of names there. There's British, there's French, there's Portuguese. It's worth looking at. Focus on the surname. That give, could give you some really useful clues as for where the name appears to give you some, some guidance. Certainly have a look at the Guild of One Name Studies website and they have a YouTube channel that is certainly worth exploring. Um, and there's various um, seminars and sessions from various conferences on the YouTube channel. Again, really worth exploring. Look for the migrational issue. Remember, just because you're not sure where your family went, maybe there were other people, maybe one whole village, um, or the men from one particular village went to somewhere else, and you need to know where they, where they may have gone. Or maybe you don't know where your family members went. If you looked where other people went, that is perhaps a clue to as where you can have a look at. And explore the history of the country that you're looking at so you're going to be popping your ancestors into the history of their country and seeing what shakes out of that so if we were live i would now take some questions obviously that's not going to be a possibility here I hope you have found the presentation useful. Um, if you wish to book me for a talk, I, I have taken several bookings already um, for talks for this year and for next. Um, and I am doing them sometimes live and sometimes using the internet. I am more than happy 
um, to perhaps discuss some things with you. And if you need me to have a look at that, then by all means, just drop me an email or use the contact me form just to see. Um, thank you very much for listening. I hope you've enjoyed the presentation. Thank you. Bye bye.